to all of you. Today we will have a class on the essay, The Unsurrendered People by the Nobel Laureate Kenza Buro Oe. It is part of the first module, War and its Aftermath, from the textbook, Issues That Matter. So let us begin, The Unsurrendered People by Kenza Buro Oe. This is a picture of Kenza Buro Oe. Kenza Buro Oe was born in 1935 in Shikoku, Japan. The Hiroshima bombing occurred when Oe was only a child. He started writing as a student and won the Akutagawa Award for his story, The Catch. He became famous for his novels, Nip the Buds, Shoot the Kids, The Youth Who Came Late. Oe was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1994. His first son, Hikari's brain damage and disability, was a significant influence on Oe's life. His writings featured two dominant aspects of his life. First, his incapacitated child who went on to become a music composer. And second, a world of his own created out of myths, history, literature and cultural anthropology. So, Kenza Bure explores the traditional trope of mythical Japan and he tries to unravel its identity in post-war modern times. So he is trying to bring in a new kind of genre in writing, especially after the world wars, the second world war particularly, because Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed post the second world war. He also explores the human predicaments in the wake of ongoing developments in nuclear technology. So all of you know that the world was nuclear armed or we knew the difficulties and the devastation that nuclear weapons can bring about after the Second World War. So in his writings, he looks into uh, the nuclear technology and its developments and tells us how difficult it would be for the world in the future. His writings engage with issues like nuclear weapons, social nonconformism and existentialism. So next, I'll show you a picture of August 6, 1945 when Hiroshima was bombed. So this is a picture of the devastation that was caused by the nuclear attack by America on Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945. Next, I will read out a small excerpt from The Guardian as it was reported. Less than a minute later, the bomb exploded 600 meters above Shima Hospital, creating a wave of heat that momentarily reached 3,000 to 4,000 degrees centigrade on the ground. Winds of up to 440 meters per second roared through the entire city. Within half an hour, almost every building within a two kilometer of radius of the hypocenter was in flames. About 90% of the city's 76,000 buildings were partially or totally incinerated or reduced to rubble. Of the 33 million square meters of land considered usable before the attack, 40% was reduced to ashes. The bombed city was barely recognizable. What a day earlier had been a sprawling military city and transport hub wedged between mountain ranges to the north and the Seto Island Sea in the south was now a nuclear wasteland. Wooden homes had been burnt to the ground by firestorms. The city's rivers were filled with corpses of people desperately seeking water before they died. With the exception of a handful of concrete buildings, Hiroshima had ceased to exist. So from this you can understand the extent of devastation that was caused in Hiroshima because of the nuclear attack or the atomic bomb. So this is another picture that shows the emotional troubles that was faced by people of Hiroshima. So now you can see a picture of Hiroshima after it was rebuilt. So within uh, decades, within a couple of decades, Hiroshima, the people of Hiroshima had rebuilt themselves. So this is an essay that shows us the strength and power of the people of Hiroshima to come back after the nuclear attack. So this excerpt that is the Unsurrendered People is taken from Hiroshima Notes. Hiroshima Notes is a powerful statement on the Hiroshima bombing. 
OA in this book gives an account of the lives of the many victims of Hiroshima and the valiant efforts of those who cared for them. So it shows us an effort to come back to normal, both immediately and after the atomic blast in the years that followed. The book reveals the horrific extent of the devastation. It is a heart-rending portrait of a ravaged city in the midst of nuclear destruction. So this is what Hiroshima Notes talks about and the unsurrendered people is taken from this book. So coming to the unsurrendered people, I'll give you a brief introduction about the unsurrendered people. The unsurrendered people is taken from Hiroshima Notes like we saw just now. The author tries to decipher how the bombing survivors faced the dehumanizing violent event with courage. So first of all, the author is trying to tell us how the survivors survived this uh, dehumanizing violent attack, the atomic bomb. Okay, the tone of the essay is both affirmative of the people's determination to rebuild their lives. That means it talks about how they had the willpower to come back and critical of the minds that inflicted this catastrophe on them. So it is also critical of the American minds of the people of America who dare to put such a lethal bomb on a people on Hiroshima, on, the, on, on people who live in another part of this world. The bombing of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945 killed 140,000 people and thousands were rendered crippled and many were traumatized. So people ha went through a very difficult situation. Not only this, it left an entire generation born with debilitating defects caused by radioactivity. So the bombing affected not only the people who lived during the time of the war, but also left generations affected due to the radioactivity. OA remains a strong advocate of democracy and anti-nuclear activism. So he ardently preaches for democracy and he is against nuclear weapons. In order to understand this essay more clearly, uh, we can divide this essay into 10 paragraphs. As you can look in, if you look into your textbook, this uh, essay is clearly divided into 10 paragraphs. And if you analyze each paragraph, it would be very easy for us to comprehend the essay. So let us begin with paragraph 1. So what is the essence of the first paragraph? In the first paragraph, Kenzaburo Oe talks about uh, atomic bomb, the atomic war, which is an absolute evil both to the victims and the survivors. That is what he is trying to tell us. Atomic war is an absolute evil both to the victims and the survivors. It is no longer in practice to see the world in terms of dualism of good and evil, but the atomic bomb came into the lives of the victims as an absolute evil and it was extremely necessary to have an absolute good to recover human balance in the world and resist this evil. So there was a practice in the world to look at everything in binaries, to look at things like good and evil, master and slave. But here, and but that trend has lost its charm or nowadays people don't look at things in binaries. But the atomic bomb was so bad and evil that people were forced to look at it as good and evil. And we are forced to think about an absolute good to counter this absolute evil. That is what the author tries to say. So the atomic bomb was so much of an evil, was an absolute evil that we needed an absolute good and we were forced to think in this dualism, in this binary. So it is no longer in practice to see the world in terms of dualism of good and evil, but the atomic bomb came into the lives of victims as an absolute evil and it was extremely necessary to have an absolute good to recover the balance in the world and resist this evil. So an absolute good was necessary to, to remove the absolute evil. From the moment it exploded, the atomic bomb became the symbol of all human evil. So the atomic bomb was a symbol of all human evil present until then in this world. It was a savagely primitive demon and a most modern curse. So it was so bad that it was a savagely primitive demon and as well as a most modern curse. The absolute evil transcended all distinctions whether they are the attacker or the attack, Japanese or allies. So irrespective of who they are, whether they are the victims, the survivors, the attackers, 
which faction they belong to in the world war, whether they belong to the Axis powers or the Allied powers, the atomic bomb was an absolute evil and we needed an absolute good to recover from this absolute evil. So this atomic attack was an absolute evil and we needed an absolute good to recover from this absolute evil. Coming to the next paragraph, in the next paragraph, the author mainly talks about harmony of doctors to fight the demonic aftermath. So how doctors played an important role in fighting this evil, this atomic evil, atomic bomb. Human goodwill began to go out into action immediately after the bomb was dropped. So human goodwill began to pour out in Hiroshima from the moment the bomb was dropped. People began to work for recovery and restoration. This determination to get things right was seen both in the victim's will to live and in the doctor's efforts who worked in complete vacuum of support systems. So you have to understand that after the bomb was dropped, people were in utter destruction. There was a lot of devastation. They were traumatized and yet they stood up. They had a will to come back. They wanted to set things right. So that is the victim's will to live. They were determined to come back. And the doctor's efforts, the doctors of Hiroshima who started helping these victims to come back to normal state in the complete absence of any support system. They did not have hospitals, they did not have equipments, nothing was there, everything was incinerated, bombed, devastated completely, yet they came and tried to help these victims. So the acts, acts of the doctors was enough to cope with the aftermath of the disaster the result of the thrust of accumulated science which produced the atom bomb. So the atom bomb was actually the accumulated science known until then. Okay, All scientists had put their brains together to develop something called an atomic bomb. And what did it do? It actually killed all these people. So it is a thrust of science, accumulated sciences known until then. And it was, it was this thrust that the people were fighting. Okay, So the acts of the doctors was enough to cope with the aftermath of this disaster. Coming to the next paragraph, paragraph 3. So here uh, the author or the writer talks about the nightmare and the aversion towards atomic war. Okay, So the author talks about the aversion towards atomic war. The author talks about a nightmare, a kind of trust in humanity. Okay, It is a nightmare about a trust in human strength, humanism that flashed across the minds of Americans who decided to drop the atomic bomb. So here, uh, the author talks about a kind of trust in humanity or humanism. Humanism means a trust in humanity uh, 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 and a notion that humans have the ability to do things. And the author is worried about, okay, has an aversion towards this kind of humanism. Okay, So the A-bomb planners or the atomic bomb planners trusted too much in the enemy's own human strength to cope with hell that will follow the dropping of the atomic bomb. So here, uh, the atomic bomb droppers, that is the Americans, trusted too much in the Japanese will to recover. And that is paradoxical. This is the most paradoxical humanism. Usually humanism results in the development and welfare of humans, but here it led to a catastrophe. So the lethal bomb which was dropped will result in a scientifically predictable hell, but the hell will not be so completely beyond the possibility of human recovery. That is the question. So here, uh, the main point is that you uh, you have to understand is paradoxical humanism. Okay. So humanism means a trust in human strength. That is human's ability to do certain things. But it is paradoxical here because uh, the, the the Japanese are expected to do much better than the Americans who actually inflicted destruction upon them. Okay, so that is what is paradoxical. Coming to paragraph 4, here the author talks about what would be the aftermath if the bomb would have been used in some other part of the world. Okay, so that is what is being talked about in this paragraph. Suppose the atomic bomb was dropped on Leopoldville, Congo. Suppose it was dropped in another part of the world, say like Leopoldville, Congo in Africa. Wounded survivors would be forced to accept a total surrender. So here the author is trying to make a contrast and telling us how the Japanese people, the people of Hiroshima are very strong compared to people in another part of the world. Epidemics would have spread and pests would have proliferated in the desolate ruins. 
the survivors of Hiroshima made no effort to make the Americans feel what a dreadful thing they had done. So here he says, if it had been some other part of the world, people would have been dejected, they would be depressed, they would never try to come out of their situation. Okay, pests would proliferate, okay, there would be diseases all over, epidemics would spread, but that is not the case with Hiroshima or the people of Hiroshima. They were ready to come back, restore themselves, okay, rehabilitate themselves. They had the will to do that. That is what the author is trying to say. The survivors of Hiroshima made no efforts to make the Americans feel what a dreadful thing they had done. And they did not complain much to the Americans. They did not cry and moan. They just decided to be normal, to come back to themselves, to set things right. They began to recover and rebuild and in doing so served to lessen the burden of the consciousness of those who had dropped the atomic bomb. So by coming back to their normal situation as early as possible, by rebuilding themselves, they also reduced the burden of consciousness on the people who actually dropped the atomic bomb. Okay? People who had dropped the bomb must have definitely felt what a dreadful thing they had done to humanity. So by coming back to their normal situation, the Japanese people actually helped everybody, not only uh, in their physical lives, but also in their emotional lives. Coming to paragraph 5, the consequences of atomic war continue for decades. So in this paragraph, the author mainly talks about how within decades they were able to rebuild themselves, the consequences of atomic war and how they continued it for decades. And people do not give up hope, they do not give up hope and it reduces the burden that the atomic droppers feel. That is what is discussed in paragraph 5. Coming to paragraph 6. Presumption of a built-in harmony that would counterbalance the evil unleashed. It is quite abnormal that people in one city should decide to drop atomic bomb on people of another city. Okay, so the author is finding it very strange that people of one city would decide to drop a bomb on people of another city because we are all humans. The author presumes that it was done on the basis of some calculation of a built-in harmony which says if the destructive bomb is dropped, the greatest effort in history would be to counterbalance the totality of the enormous evil to follow. So the author says it was actually dropped, the atomic bomb was dropped thinking that there is some kind of built-in harmony or built-in balance in nature that if you unleash a kind of evil upon a set of people, there is another force that would set things right. They had this presumption or the presupposition that something is going to come, that there is a force in the world that would set things right. So the author presumes that it was done on the basis of some calculation of a built-in harmony, some built-in balance which says if the destructive bomb is dropped, okay, so if a destructive bomb is dropped, the greatest effort in history would be to counterbalance the totality of the enormous evil to follow. So there would be a force which would counterbalance this evil and set things right. Which means the inhuman damage caused would be mitigated by the humane efforts of those struggling to hope, find hope in the desperate situation. So here the author feels that the inhuman damage would be mitigated by the humane efforts of those who are struggling to set things right. So the inhuman damage was afflicted by the, by the Americans and it would be mitigated by the humane efforts, okay, humane efforts of the people of Hiroshima who were struggling to find hope in this desperate situation. So they are trying to find hope and they have the will to do it. And here the author is re-emphasizing how strong the people of Hiroshima are. Coming to the next paragraph, paragraph 7, here the attacker expected the scapegoat to set things right. But it is the scapegoat's inability that is usually seen before the attacker. So when there is a fight between an attacking wolf and a scapegoat or an attacking wolf attacks a scapegoat, the scapegoat is a weaker entity okay? and the wolf is the stronger entity. But here there is an irony. The balancing reflects a confidence in human strength that is humanism that we looked in the previous paragraph. But it is the attacking wolf's confidence in the scapegoat's ability to set things right after the damage is done. That is what the, uh, the attackers, that is the Americans, expected of the people of Hiroshima. Here the attacking wolf are the Americans and the scapegoat is the people of Hiroshima. 
But the attacking wolves, that is the Americans, had a confidence in the people of Hiroshima and they expected the people of Hiroshima to set things right. And that is a gruesome nightmare because here humanism is expected or the ability is expected uh, from the people who are attacked. Okay, It is a gruesome nightmare about humanism. That is what the author talks about. So the balancing is a paradox. Coming to the next paragraph, paragraph 8. The patience of A-bomb victims. The A-bomb victims patiently await their turns in the room of Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission and their stoicism reduces the emotional burden of American doctors working there. This is what is mainly talked about in this paragraph. So how the stoicism, stoicism means their patients, they are not wailing and crying and making a huge noise about what happened to them, but they just take in, they just soak in what happened and they are patiently waiting for their turns in the, in the hospitals. And it, on, it not only reduces their emotional burden, but also the emotional burden of the American doctors who are working to help the people survive the atomic bomb. Coming to paragraph 9. Comparison with the biblical character of Noah and his will and ability. So God made the rain fall for 40 days and 40 nights and trusted that Noah would rebuild the human society after the great flood ended. So here there is a reference to the biblical character of Noah and the great flood and how God made it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights and how Noah rebuilt humanity. But if Noah was a lazy man or given to despair, God's plan would not have worked. So if Noah was a lazy man, God's plan would not have worked. Fortunately, Noah was a man of will and ability and thus God's expectations were fulfilled. The question here is, did God too count on the built-in harmony of balancing out? If so, does God not seem rather vicious? So here the question is, is God also believing in this kind of balancing that if an, if an evil is unleashed, there is a counterbalance to set things right okay so this is the question so if, if Noah was a lazy man things would not have been right so here we can understand the author is questioning the very uh, powers of God where uh, there is an expected balancing out in nature coming to the last and final paragraph paragraph 10 atomic war was a universal deluge that is frozen not receded 20th century has been afflicted with a cancer so atomic destruction of Hiroshima was the worst deluge of the 20th century. Here uh, the author is comparing uh, the atomic bomb with a universal deluge or atomic destruction with a universal deluge. Deluge means a huge flood. So atomic destruction of Hiroshima was the worst deluge of the 20th century. But by going back to work, that is by going back to work immediately after the bombing, the people of Hiroshima salvaged, salvage means reduced or uplifted not only their lives but also the souls of those who brought the atomic bomb. So the people of Hiroshima were so strong and they had so much will that immediately after the dropping of the atomic bomb they went back to work and it salvaged or uplifted not only their souls but also the souls of the Americans who had dropped the atomic bomb. So the author further uses the metaphors to compare the possession of nuclear weapons by countries in the present age. So in the present age, uh, the possession of uh, nuclear weapons by different countries is compared with two metaphors. Okay? The author compares the possession of nuclear weapons with two metaphors. First, he compares it to the great flood or a deluge. The great flood of the present is a kind of universal deluge which instead of receding has become frozen and we cannot tell when it will flow away. The countries of today have nuclear weapons. Okay, So it is all possessed by these countries and they are not using it at present. So it is like a great flood that they have. Okay, It is frozen. Nobody knows when it will thaw. Okay, And when it will thaw and flow away, it is going to bring in one of the worst deluges of the world. So the great flood is frozen today and one day when it will flow out it is going to bring about 
a lot of devastation in the world. The second metaphor that he compares it with is that the 20th century has become afflicted with a cancer for which there is no cure. So he is comparing the atomic war with cancer, the cancer of the 20th century which has no cure. Finally, the author says that the souls that were salvaged by the people of Hiroshima are the souls of all human beings alive today. So the meaning of this is that had the people of Hiroshima, had the victims, had the people who died in Hiroshima not been dead, we would rather not be alive today because, because uh, only because they took the atomic bomb and gave up their lives for us that we are alive today and we know the extent of atomic destruction and we dare not use it in another part of the world. Okay? So in a way you can say that because they gave up their lives for us, we are alive today. If they hadn't given up their lives for us, probably at any time we would all be dead by the atomic war or the atomic destruction. So with that we come to the conclusion of the essay. Next, we look at the title of the essay. The essay, The Unsurrendered People, talks about how the people of Hiroshima were able to rebuild and restore themselves post the dropping of the atomic bomb. So after the atomic bomb, how they were able to rebuild and restore themselves. The essay gives an account of the lives of the many victims of Hiroshima and the valiant efforts of those who cared for them. Okay, so it gives an account of the lives of people and what efforts they took to rebuild themselves and also about the doctors who cared for them both immediately and after the blast not only at the moment but also in the decades that followed it reveals the horrific extent of the devastation it is a heartrending portrait of the ravaged city in the midst of nuclear destruction that is portrayed in the essay with dexterity dexterity means clarity it is an account of the relentless and unyielding perseverance. Okay, so they were unyieldingly pursuing. They took a lot of effort to come back to their normal lives. Okay, the people of Hiroshima took great efforts to set their lives back to normal. So this is the title, the reason for entitling the essay as the unsurrendered people. They never gave up. So they are working hard to set themselves right and they are making their country, their city and taking themselves to great heights. With this, we come to the conclusion of the unsurrendered people. Thank you.